GitHub. Thank you for coming. My name is Julio Avalos. I'm GitHub's general counsel and chief strategy officer. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you all here to our headquarters. Um, we have an amazing panel today on a critical topic. And I'm so pleased that GitHub gets to host. And I really wanted to thank, and we'll hear from Abby soon, but I wanted to thank Abby Vollmer from our policy team for helping to organize this and to Tal Neve, our VP of Law and Policy and Deputy GC, who's unfortunately home with pneumonia. I think that's, that's real. Um, and fighting that off, so we wish Tal the best. I think she may be watching on the stream. Um, we are talking today on an issue, I think, of critical importance. And Abby will speak shortly, and the panel will speak shortly on what the specific import is of the parliamentary and European parliamentary proposals and their impact on open source development, on software development. But I wanted to take a step back and really frame for us how I've been thinking about these issues and even the fact that we're sitting here in San Francisco about to engage and discuss and analyze parliamentary proposals and debates happening within the European Union is in and of itself significant. And I think it's significant for a number of different reasons. Number one, and I think it's an important one to take note of, even in an age where we are increasingly told of the death of globalization, the pullback and re-entrenchment that we see from an administrative perspective here within the states and in other nationalities and other jurisdictions around the world, I think that it's a reminder that if all politics is often said to be local, all policy in the 21st century and increasingly and certainly policy in an online and internet context is almost by definition immediately global and that these are issues that we cannot afford to ignore. The second point, relatedly, is sitting here within the United States that for a long time has viewed itself as the standard bearers of online standards, of expectations, of regulation when it comes to policy expectations, user expectations, security, et cetera, that given some of the changes that we've seen over the last three, four, five years, I do think that we're at an interesting inflection point where we are increasingly, and I think we'll continue to be increasingly looking abroad for leadership in a regulatory paradigm, from a technology standpoint, when it comes to 21st century online norms. I know that in my practice previously as an as attorney and litigator for social media companies, for Facebook, et cetera, where we assumed that as the in-house counsel that we were creating the law, that we were creating in some way quasi-parliamentary and legislative frameworks that were going to hold true across our borders and around the world, that that is increasingly not the case. And that that combination between, I think, an opinionated European Union, European Commission, the Article 13 working groups, et cetera, that have been going on, these conversations have been going on for decade or more at this point, that that voice is an increasingly powerful voice that American technology companies and American online users and a global online community cannot afford to ignore. And I think that while we've had some issues and we're here to discuss issues that we've had with some of the specific proposals before the European Union and that have come out of these working groups in the committee, at the same time, I want to thank those groups and those bodies for their leadership, I think, and their indefatigable opinions when it comes to privacy, when it comes to user expectations, when it comes to a more meaningful role for legislative bodies within these conversations that we have about online norms and online life. And finally, and I'll close on this point, tonight's conversation for me, I, did, I think, highlights the limitations as well as the opportunities in 21st century advocacy and 21st century regulation and policy making, particularly as it relates to the internet. We talk a lot internally here at GitHub about the 20th century being a period of disjunction. Your consumer or your business. You're in a business to make a profit or you're into a business to try and make a positive impact. 
on cloud, and we've carried over a lot of this disjunctive either-or thinking into the 21st century and how we think particularly about, the, about online life and about our use of software, where your enterprise or your SaaS, your consumer or your enterprise, it's the nation state or it's public, your private or public, your education or capitalistic, all of these lines, I think, in this kind of nearing the quarter mark of this new century, we've started to see that a, a frame of the 21st century that is increasingly conjunctive, where it's not a matter of either or or, but a matter of and, the United States and Europe, public sector and private sector, education, academia, and for-profit enterprises, and that it's only through this plurality of voices, and maybe most fundamentally, I think that that's part of what GitHub's objections or feedback has been for the proposals that are currently being looked at, debated, and voted on is perhaps a lack of attention to the human being, the developer, at the center of this technology. The industry, software, Silicon Valley is properly criticized, and I criticize it frequently, for an over-infatuation on growth for the sake of growth automation for the sake of automation, and disruption for the sake of disruption, as if these things were somehow utilities in and of themselves disconnected from the human beings that are ultimately using these technologies and that ultimately should be benefiting from these technologies. And that most fundamentally, I think that if GitHub is about anything, it's about that developer. It's about that human being and putting ourselves in the position of reifying the abstract and how these policies are actually going to have unintended consequences to the creators, to the innovators, to the entrepreneurs that are currently out building tomorrow and building the future of the technologies that we will be using. And, and to illustrate that point, I was thinking uh, as I was preparing for tonight, back in 2015 at a particularly frothy point in the Hillary Clinton email server scandal, Lindsey Graham, I remember watching, it was on Meet the Press, Chuck Todd asked Lindsey Graham, senator, uh, senator, longtime senator, whether he himself was afraid of his email being hacked or his email being leaked. And his very nonchalant kind of sang froid response was, no, not at all. And when Chuck Todd pushed him and said, well, how, how come you're not afraid of that? He responded, well, I've never used it. I've never written an email, right? And that for me, dealing with hundreds of emails every day for most of my adult life, was a really startling admission. And yet if we fast forward three years almost to the day, to Lindsey Graham questioning Mark Zuckerberg during the Zuckerberg Facebook Cambridge Analytica hearings, was excoriated, taken to task and mocked for asking Zuckerberg whether Facebook would join with him and Congress in developing a path forward and regulation to try and contain these issues. And to my thinking, not only was that not something to be mocked, it's exactly one of the inroads and paths that we should be following. Again, is this pairing. I don't want someone that's never used email to be controlling what the future of the internet looks like or what the regulation looks like. These things, again, have to be partnerships between Public, private, education, for-profits, non-profits, and ultimately with the human beings that are ultimately using these services, whose data ends up floating around the, the internet in all types of places. How do we represent that voice in these conversations? And I think that ultimately that's all that GitHub has wanted to do, whether in this policy debate or other policy debates like it. And without further ado, I'm very excited about the talk and thank everyone again for coming. I'll turn it over to Abby Vollmer from our policy team. Thank you very much. Thanks so much everyone for coming and to those of you who are watching online. Um, and thanks to Julio for the overview. Um, Abby Vollmer, or Volmera, we kind of go by our handles here at GitHub. Um, I'm on the policy team and have been working on this issue um, with my colleague, Tal Neve and Mike Linksveyer um, tirelessly, but also alongside many, many developers in the EU who have done an amazing job so far of really trying to raise this issue. And we're tonight hoping to um, not only give you background about what's happening, but impress upon you the 
unfortunate circumstance that this is not over. It's still continuing, and we really need more people, um, particularly people who understand software, to reach out to MEPs, members of European Parliament, and explain um, why open source is so important and what's at stake here. Um, before we get to Martin speaking and the panel after that, I just wanted to give a very small amount of background for anybody who might not be following these details to be able to do that enough that when you contact a member of European Parliament, you sound credible and make sense. Um, so just real quick, um, the institutions at, at play here in the EU when we're talking about making laws are the EU Commission, which is uh, made up of 28 people, 28 commissioners, one from each member state. They're experts in their field. They propose legislation. Then there's the council, which is made up of member states of each of the governments of the EU, and the parliament, made up of members of European Parliament who are elected by EU citizens. And so the commission will propose legislation, and the council and the parliament each then can make amendments, and in the end, they all come together in what are called trilogues and find a version that they're all happy with. So where are we with respect to this copyright directive? Um, tonight we're here to talk about the EU copyright directive, which was proposed by the Commission in September of 2016. Since then, the Council and Parliament have each been proposing amendments. The Council has gotten to a place where they are happy with their version, and that was adopted as a negotiating mandate in May of this year, which basically means when they go to the trilogues, they have that to kind of work from as their basis. Um, over in Parliament, they're still working on what version they're happy with, and there's actually a vote on that a week from today. So that is why we're really focused on Parliament tonight, and we're really trying to um, get through to MEPs, uh, in particular because, and again, I don't want to get into too many unnecessary details, but this is actually, I think, pretty interesting in a sense, because in Parliament so far, there's been one committee that's been leading the negotiations. And they actually passed something they were happy with and they were ready to go to negotiate with commission and the council. And then another group of MEPs decided they were not happy with it and they used a very rare procedure to challenge that vote and they won. And so they won in saying, let's not move forward right now. Let's kick this back to the entire 751 member parliament. So that's where we are now. We have 700 plus people who have Many of them probably happily been ignoring this because they know that this other committee has been handling it. And now they're all being asked to vote on something that they may not really know too much about. And if they are hearing about it, they're probably not focused on the software development aspect of it because we are, as Julio mentioned, an unintended consequence of this whole thing. So um, what is this whole thing? <laughs> Basically, um, you know, as Julio mentioned, we have laws that are being made by people that may not understand all the nuances of technology. At the same time, copyright laws fairly outdated in a lot of ways if you think about how we use copyrighted content. So there is a need to kind of come together and figure out how to update it. Um, there are certain issues that are involved in this particular proposal that are pretty tricky. And there are three in particular, three articles in particular that I wanted to call out as not only the most controversial ones, but also the ones that affect software developers the most directly. So we'll get into the details a little bit more later, but just to highlight those, there's article three that deals with text and data mining very important for artificial intelligence, machine learning. There's Article 11, which would create an, an ancillary right, it's called, like another neighboring right for press publishers, um, which would affect software developers and their ability to be able to use um, text that's linking to articles and things like that. And then there's Article 13, which if you have heard about this, might be the one that you've heard about the most because it would require platforms like GitHub where people are uploading content to have to take certain measures like upload filters that would, filters that would upload content that um, people want to uh, store or share on our site. And those filters, as you may or may not know, <laughs> wouldn't necessarily be able to detect copyright infringement all that well, especially with respect to software code. So that's kind of um, where we're coming from on this. The whole copyright directive has been very heavily lobbied, mostly by the content industry, record labels, press publishers, who are trying to gain control over platforms. And then on the other side, you have a lot of civil rights groups, um, civil society groups, and digital rights groups, and tech industry, large and small, very concerned about censorship, um, and really lawmaking happening in a way that has a lot of collateral damage that's not being considered. So um, I'll get into that a little bit more when we get to the panel, but I want to make sure Martin has enough time to speak. Um, and I really appreciate you all coming, and there will be time at the end for questions. So thanks again, everyone.
Good evening, everybody. I'm Martin Mikos, CEO of HackerOne, uh, formerly CEO of MySQL, the largest open source company to ever have come out of Europe. So I guess that's, that's why I'm invited here. We, we live in the best of times. And <clears throat> day to day, and when you look at policy and society, you may not think so, but we actually live in the best of times. We are shifting this whole civilization from a physical one to a digital one. And it's not easy, but, but we are doing phenomenal progress and open source software is playing an absolutely critical role there. Software development in general, of course, is the way to define a digital society. But the only societies that truly thrive and will do well are the ones that are open, transparent, <clears throat> where you collaborate, where you share, where you build on what others have built. That's the only way to build a successful civilization. And you can look back at any past civilization and they've all followed those principles. So the fact that we are so early in this digitalization and already open source software plays su such a central role is fantastic news. It is actually, we have, there's some, that's something that we got right from the beginning. And it has allowed us now to collaborate worldwide. And the beauty of open source software is not that people who agree collaborate. The beauty of open source software is that people who disagree collaborate. So it's an amazing model and it is so powerful that today in San Francisco we have to worry about legislation from Brussels. How is that happening? Like why do we even care? We have enough political problems in this country. Yet because of this worldwide collaboration and networking of everything, we in San Francisco have to be worried about what those people in Brussels are doing. And we have to bring together all of our friends and people and encourage everybody to stand up and defend the right principles. The principles of freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of collaboration, freedom of modification of something that somebody else has built. But now we're sitting here with an EU that has done a phenomenal job so far. GDPR is a, one of a very significant and positive step forward in protecting citizens. And the copyright directive is needed because it brings harmonization to EU, which always talked about harmonization but didn't necessarily do it on, in the digital realm. Now it's happening. So all of that is great. <clears throat> but Article 13 is just crap. It will benefit nobody but the richest, the wealthiest, the biggest. Those who can spend tens of millions or hundreds of millions on building some amazing filters that will somehow know whether something is copyrighted or not. It's a completely unreasonable demand to put that on all those who are trying to build a business, an open source business or some other business. It will hit at the small, it will hit at the creative people, it will hit at those who are actually building what we need for the future. And the only ones who will benefit are those who are doing nothing. Those who are just sitting there on old copyright, copyrights that they bought from somewhere and that they would like to charge a rent for from more and more people. And we must resist that. And that is the power of the European Union is to defend the citizen and defend the people of EU against uh, interests that are so large and so uh, full of money that they, they lose their humanity. And that's why Article 13 can be so damaging. But it's exactly as Julio said, the politicians don't necessarily realize it because they don't necessarily send emails. And even if they send emails, they don't write code. They don't know what downloading a Linux distro means. They don't know what uploading uh, code to a, a cloud image, what that means. They don't know any of this. They have no idea of how much data is already going up and down and how much value it's creating. And that's why they can't even see that Article 13 is very damaging. It won't serve the most creative, the most well-intended, the most spirited, intelligent people who are out there to build things. They will just put uh, an undue burden on them on trying to find something that's impossible to find. And specifically in the area of freedom of expression, there are borderline cases that we must always protect. 
such as satire and irony. And to do good satire, you have to use somebody else's copyright a little bit. You have to take what somebody else built and build something on top of it to make fun of it. It's an essential right of the Western world. And if you start having stupid filters who block anything that even looks like copyrighted material, you will uh, essentially block freedom of speech. That's why this is so important. It's important that we who are here call our friends who are voters in the European Union, ask them to contact their members of the par European Parliament, the MEPs, and have them have a second thought about this. Because think about those maps and how in Brussels, they're sitting there with so many directives coming and going. Every directive has so many articles that they can never keep track of them. And at some point they say, I'm having dinner tonight, I'm not reading that one more document or email, and then just say, whatever, we'll fix it later. And that must not happen with Article 13. We need to get them to see that it's worth stopping because it will harm uh, the creative people and those who are building society in a way that will be impossible to measure. We won't even be able later to say, look, it was Article 13 who caused it. So we must stop it before it gets there. So therefore, we must stand up for our rights. We must stand up for the rights here in San Francisco because we are working together with everybody in the European Union. It's 500 million people, so it's a lot of people there. And I'm very thankful to GitHub for setting up this event and bringing focus to one single little detail, Article 13, which we just, we need to stop. Thank you. Thanks so much, Martin. Uh, I'll invite the panelists to come up on the stage now. Um, and just to say, as they are coming up here, um, this is the first event that GitHub has done that is a policy-focused event for developers. And so, um, you know, at the end, we will have a chance for Q&A, both for Martin and for the panelists. And I do hope that people will, um, you know, kind of press us on things that they may want to know. And in particular for developers who may be approaching uh, their members of parliament for the first time, um, our hope is to kind of help you get a sense of what might be new and, not, uh, and relevant for them, that even if it's totally obvious to you why open source is important, they may not get that. So kind of building on what Martin was saying, um, I think this is what we can keep that in mind maybe as we're talking with um, these panelists and then towards the end, you know, feel free to ask us any questions including um, how your story might be most effective. First, I'm going to just quickly introduce each of the panelists, um, and then uh, I will ask and answer my first question before having them answer the same question so they have some time to think about it. Um, this is Danny O'Brien, the International Director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF. This is Jessica Ashu, who is the Director of Policy at Reddit. And this is Jan Gerlach, who is the Senior Public Policy Manager at the Wikimedia Foundation. So um, in getting this group of people together on stage, one thing that Reddit and Wikimedia and GitHub, GitHub all have in common is that we are platforms where our users are uploading content onto our sites and they need to be able to do that to use our services. And we're all very dependent on open source. So for us, looking at this directive, there are some commonality in the issues that we face. And then we have EFF, which is both expert and watchdog on uh, digital activists, digital rights issues. And so this conversation is sort of kind of touching on all of that. Um, and I'll ask questions. The first question I will ask to everybody, and then from then on, I will probably just pick one person to start. And if anybody wants to add, then please do. Uh, and at the end, we'll have the Q&A. So my first question is quite general, but I think important for everybody to know, what are your concerns, your users' concerns about this proposal? Um, and so I'll answer it first for GitHub. Uh, GitHub is, as I'm sure most or hopefully most of you know, is a software development platform. So people, mostly developers, are using our site to upload software code um, so that they can collaborate with other people to build software. Um, and so for us, you know, although this is not in any, by any stretch the focus of the copyright directive, we started hearing about it. We even heard that Article 13 was being referred to as the GitHub article in, in terms of how it was going to have effects on software. Um, and so in October of 2017, we uh, joined this effort 
by Open Forum Europe and the Free Software Foundation of Europe called Save Code Share. Their website is savecodeshare.eu. There's a petition there that we signed and a white paper that we contributed to to kind of explain some of these unintended consequences for software. Um, but as we realized that there were not so many people speaking up about software specifically, we decided to go to Brussels and meet with other organizations, companies that were affected by this and talk to policymakers directly. And um, what I heard from policymakers was great, can you get some developers to talk to us directly and explain this to us? So <laughs> we said, okay, um, we'll do that. So we wrote a blog post with a call to action to developers in the EU, um, really explaining to them that this about this proposal, that it would require upload filters, why upload filters are ineffective for detecting copyright infringement, particularly for software code, why this is a concern from the perspective of privacy, given that it's a form of surveillance, why it's a concern from freedom of expression, because you know, all of a sudden de dependencies may disappear, meaning that you're, whatever you're trying to build may no longer work. Um, and so this was pretty easy for, I think, a lot of developers to relate to, and we got a great response. A lot of people writing to us very emphatically, like, open source is my life. This is, like, the basis of my research, the basis of my work. The EU is funding my work, all these sorts of stories. And so we said, please, like, here are the people to contact, tell them this. And we saw responses from both the council and the parliament trying to exclude software development. Um, and I think this is something we can get into a little bit later about the, you know, how, how much of a victory it is if it's just some sort of exclusion as opposed to trying to really get it right in, in the approach to the whole um, directive itself. Um, but we continue to work um, with policymakers on understanding how important software development is to Europe and how open source software development is fundamentally part of any kind of software that's being built. Um, and, and that is all quite new to a lot of people that we've spoken with. So I think in you know working hand in hand with developers directly, we've, we've been trying to get this meshes across to kind of explain the concerns that we see um, for software development. So with that, <laughs> I will ask Jan, why does Wikimedia care about this? Why do your users care? Oh, you have, okay. I have my own, <laughs> even though I would rather use that one. Um, but, Feel free right. to jump up there. If why, do, why do we care? Um, so um, Wiki, Wikimedia, Wikipedia is built on open source software as well, um, but I think you're not asking me about that. Um, Wikipedia is also open source, but not from a, not only from a software perspective, but also from a content perspective. Um, thousands of people around the world, including from the EU, collaborate, build um, articles on there for everybody to share, to read, to um, access knowledge uh, in the purest form. Um, and we care because Wikipedia is a place where people bring knowledge that they find elsewhere. Um, as you know, References are very important to Wikipedians. Uh, when you start writing an article, when you improve an article, when you edit an article, you actually have to provide citations to what you're writing there. Um, those citations link elsewhere. They refer to places elsewhere on the web. And Wikipedia does not exist in a vacuum. We really depend on the basically free flow of knowledge, of people's ability to find information and knowledge elsewhere on the web and to bring it to Wikipedia under a free license um, or under, um, and with the ability to really re reference it, um, to critique it, to talk about it. And when you implement uh, technological measures to avoid copyright infringement um, that are blind to possible exceptions that are at play, um, that are blind to, to national laws being at play here, not just one countries, but some other countries where they're from, um, you really have a problem with building an encyclopedia that we want to build and that our users and the community wants to build. And that's why we're really concerned with the pre-filtering requirements that um, are still in um, the current proposal as we know it, even though we're looking at the amendments coming in today and we still don't have a complete list of that. There's a large concern over this, of course. Yeah, I mean, this is something that Reddit as a company obviously cares a lot about because I really want to associate myself with what Martin said previously about how this directive impacts smaller companies and the long tail of small and medium-sized companies that really make up the heart of the tech industry that just seem to not be considered at all in the current text of this legislation. This legislation, you know, was clearly written with the biggest players in mind um, and there's just a lot of collateral damage for small companies like ours. And it may sound funny to be talking about Reddit as a small company. People 
often don't know how small we actually are because you know we're a huge platform, we're 330 million users around the world, but we're 400 people in terms of employees, and 200 of those employees started within the last year. Two years ago, we were 65 people, so we're growing, but we're still very, very small um, and have the resources of a small company that is still private and not yet profitable. Um, and so when we look at some of the requirements, particularly Article 13, there's just, there's, I don't, I really, as the head of policy, don't know what we would do because we do not have the resources to comply with that. We don't have the technological resources to impose the types of filters that would be required for us to avoid um, liability with potentially enormous um, monetary fines. Um, so I'm hoping it will not come to that because truly I don't know what smaller companies like ours would do. And at a time um, when people on both sides of the Atlantic are talking about whether the largest players are too big or whether they have a monopoly, it strikes me as really um, troublesome that we would be considering a, a piece of legislation now that would do nothing other than cement the largest players in their preeminent position right now and make it smaller for harder, com for s harder for smaller companies to compete. So that's kind of my corporate hat and why Reddit as a business uh, cares about this issue. But really, I mean, the reason that I'm here talking about this tonight and why we've been outspoken as a company on this is because our users have demanded it uh, of us. Um, so like I said, we're really small. Our public policy team is a team of one. I am the sole employee um, at Reddit that is 100% focused on public policy. And frankly, we choose our battles and um, I am pretty much only focused on public policy in the United States because there's more than enough there um, to keep me very busy five times over. However, um, users started messaging me and contacting me, asking, what's Reddit going to do about this? Have you heard about the EU copyright directive? Let's, you know, let's do something about this. And I was at, um, this past spring, um, a, a conference that many of you may have been to um, in the past called RightsCon. It's an annual digital rights conference that moves around the world. And people were coming up to me at that saying, what is Reddit going to do about the EU copyright directive? I, to be honest, it was like a little bit annoying because I was like, what is this thing? Um, and then I looked at it and I was like, oh, this is actually a huge problem um, for all of the reasons that uh, I just mentioned from our business model perspective. Um, so we started um, looking into it more and the amazing thing that we found and this always happens on Reddit is like our users are always way ahead of the game on us. Um, so I was poking around in our r slash Europe community and of course they have been spectacular on this issue. If you go into r slash Europe um, they have sticky posts from their moderators on these issues breaking out you know, in incredible detail how the European Parliament works and where we are in the process. They hosted an AMA with Julia Reda, who is um, an MEP who's been incredibly active and, and constructive on this issue. So um, we are once again being led by our users and I'm, I'm very happy to be in that position, particularly because our users are so sophisticated on this. If you go in, um, the conversation is extremely nuanced. They really take in um, all sides of this debate and get to the heart of why it matters. And um, Redditors as, as, a, as creatures are really concerned about the open internet writ large. So this isn't just about EU copyright directive. Like you can go back in our history and look at their activism on SOPA and PIPA, for example. Um, they really, really care about the open internet. And so um, I think that any, um, proponents of this copyright directive who are trying to dismiss the opposition as mere kind of Google lobbying are really misinterpreting what's going on and they're doing so at their own peril because these people really care and this is real grassroots activism. What was the question again? No, I, um, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm, I'm from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and uh, um, we've been concerned about this for um, a, a long while. Um, and really, we've been concerned about it at a slightly uh, meta level to this, because um, we, really, we really feel that, that laws like this are, are an ex existential threat 
to the, the, the internet. And I know that sounds a sort of somewhat um, forced uh, idea, but the reason why we always think of this is because we, the internet has faced these kind of battles previously, and we've, we've dodged several bullets. Uh, one of the first reactions when we were trying to draw attention to um, Article 13 in particular was people genuinely saying, well, I don't understand why would a copyright law have such a bad effect on the internet? And it's, a, it's an understandable question to have, but the truth is, is for the last 20 years or so, it's been copyright and concerns about copyright that have caused the biggest sort of regulatory challenges for the internet and for digital communications in general. And because that's such a sort of uh, existential fight um, that goes on around the internet. It's not surprising when people attempt to um, uh, uh, change the balance or try and uh, fix or resolve this problem that it has these knock-on effects with very key, pivotal um, websites and services that the internet uses. I mean, I see here um, uh, 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 several classes of the sort of things that the internet and digital communication empowers, open source development, open collaboration, open communication. But w powerful and important as these, or these organizations are, of course, they, they represent a much wider and larger set of, of activity and behavior. So uh, in the past, I, 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 my time at EFF, I've dealt with Sopa Pippa, but before Sopa Pippa, we had to deal with ideas that in these days seem absolutely crazy. So there was a proposal not so long ago um, in the US that there would be a, basically a copyright filter in your computer or, or your, your phone, but people didn't think about smartphones at that point. What the idea was is that they would put a, a, a chip that would recognize um, copyrighted material and automatically stop you from, from, from doing anything with that. And at the time we said, look, this is, this is ridiculous. It won't work. Um, this, is, this is a bad idea. Uh, and, and these things carry on almost to the end before somebody realizes that this is impossible stroke terrible. Um, same with Sopa Pippa. Sopa Pippa kind of fell at the last hurdle and actor along with it because there's this strange mix, I think, with technologists where you can't believe something like this, something so ridiculous and impractical, could actually get this far, that eventually a grown-up would come into the room and go, this won't work. And eventually people realize that you have to be the grown-up, right? You're, you're going to be the expert in the room that comes in and tells these people that this is a, this is a, ridic this is a crap idea in the, in the strong words of our, uh, our keynote speaker. Um, but this generally happens around copyright. And I think I'll just, I'll just pin down one particular thing that you will notice in this discussion. And you will notice in the law itself that one of the, the ways the upload filters are described and the class of services that will be affected um, is they say, well, all this will affect is sites that upload, that let their users upload copyrighted material and then share it. And what that means to a lawyer writing it is pirates, right? Evil, evil pirates who are taking films and then not only just watching it like God-fearing users should, but then uploading it to the, the, the devil's cloud. And, um, and, and anybody who has mixed with both either coding and you've had to write your license or copy your license or just thought for a moment about how the copyright law interacts with this, we'll realize that everything is copyrighted. Everything has been copyrighted for many, many years now, since the 70s. You don't have to sit there meticulously putting a C and then trying to work out what the Unicode is for putting a circle around it, right? It's all copyrighted. I had to sign a thing today saying I will grant GitHub a license to use my copyrighted material. And why? Because I could go... you copied my face and the things I said, that's evil, and sued them for it, right? Everything is copyrighted, and that's the fundamental problem here. Because everything is copyrighted, and because what the internet and technology allows you to do is to copy things, and that's how we get all of these beneficial um, services, because people on Reddit can can see what other people have said, because Reddit has copied what they typed into a textbook and given you that. and 
they uploaded that copyrighted content. Because everything is copyrighted in that way, if you change the copyright law, it throws this spanner into absolutely everything. There was a time when the laws, it was proposed that, that there was a long debate, let me say that, about whether caching should be exempted from copyright laws. Caching. So that was basically, couldn't, is, is it okay if RAM is legal? Uh, can we allow that? Can we allow swap files to be legal? I'm not so sure about this. What if they go swap file crazy and swap something that Disney owns? So, so this is the problem we face. And as we describe what happens here, that's the thing I want you to bear in mind, right? That this is a serious problem because it changes the one thing that can make a huge swathe of things either illegal or make companies vulnerable for being sued over something being illegal. And that small change is why this is an existential threat. Thank you. Great. And I guess just to add a, a bit, tiny bit on that. You may have heard about this as the save the memes campaign or like this is all about memes. As Danny <laughs> explained, it's not just about memes and anybody who writes open source software would know that when you choose an open source license, that is a copyright, that the open source software code is copyrightable. When you choose that license, that is a form of copyright or copyleft. And I don't think a lot of policymakers are thinking about that when they're looking at this particular law. Um, and I guess just to segue into the next question, another thing that unites um, Reddit and Wikipedia and GitHub, and then we have EFF as our sort of friend and sage advisor on this as well, um, is content moderation. Um, Reddit, Wikimedia, and GitHub all have their own level of content moderation that they do as a company, but they also rely really heavily on their users to moderate, or their, their users want to be involved in moderating their own um, activity in, in the user groups. And so I think for that, when we look at efforts to moderate content, which this um, Article 13, the upload filters issue is an example of that. Um, it's really interesting to see how that plays out with people who are trying to figure out the right way who should be making these decisions um, and how it affects our platforms. So um, given that, I'm curious to know a bit about how your communities have mobilized and what seems to resonate with policymakers. And I think I will start with Jan on this one. But again, um, Jessica and Danny, feel free to jump in if you have more to say. Um, it's really refreshing today, by the way, that, we're t that as Wikipedians, we're not the unicorns in the room for once, but there's other people who are similar. That's fun. Um, so, uh, content moderation. Um, basically, it's all done by the community. Um, I think that's the simple answer to a complicated question. Um, Wikipedians are copyright nerds. I think that's, uh, that's sort of the, the headline here. Um, um, this morning, we actually had a conversation um, with people who care about this copyright reform and strategy ahead, next seven days, do we have a landing page, where do we send people? And one of the questions was like, yeah, but is our statement freely licensed? Um, yeah, so that's all you really need to know about Wikipedians. That's how much they care about copyright. Um, and they really want to make sure that everything that is on Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons and the other um, projects that we have is freely licensed or um, in the public domain or under fair use. Um, and they uh, spend a lot of time basically um, monitoring the platform. I mean, monitoring is that bad word that nobody wants to use right now, but there was a time when people did that, right? Um, not just technology. Um, and they really spend a lot of time um, looking at every upload, at every edit, and make sure that um, it complies with the copyright um, policies of Wikipedia, which, by the way, are actually uh, stricter than the law itself, just to make sure that everything that is on the platforms, uh, and I'm speaking of platforms here, on the projects, um, is there um, and can stay there. Um, and that's also why um, I think we have a very strong argument against pre-filtering requirements because it actually works when humans do it as well. You just need the humans to do it. And um, Wikimedians, Wikipedians really care about this and that's why they also really care about this copyright reform and they don't want to be replaced <laughs> by pre-filtering um, technology. 
Um, they really care about their work. They really care about their collaboration with others on the platforms. They care about the conversations that they have about fair use, about the legal use of the content on the platforms, and that actually really improves the policies as well and makes sure that um, everything um, is compliant. Um, you've asked what ha how have they mobilized as well. Um, sort of what and how they mobilize and what seems to have worked in that. What seems to have what worked. Resonates. Well, I guess we'll see, right? Yeah. Um, hopefully. Um, maybe this will never end. Um, so around the July 5th vote, which was a vote, basically a yes or no vote about um, the, the proposal by the jury committee that you've um, described before, a lot of Wikipedia communities in Europe that are even independent from the Wikimedia chapters in Europe so basically just the people who write on Wikipedia have decided to black out Wikipedia um, for that vote or in advance of that vote to really send the message, no, this is not going ahead, this cannot happen. Um, and frankly, it took us a bit by surprise. Um, it even took some of the chapters so that the organized people who, who meet maybe once a week or, or more uh, to talk about Wikipedia and how to promote it in their countries, even those people were I think, sur taken by surprise by, by the blackouts that happened really quickly overnight. And I think um, the message that that sent to um, MEPs of the individual member states was really, we cannot let this go ahead. And we saw a lot of positive response. The chapters, the groups saw a lot of positive response. Um, MEPs reached out, press reached out, and we know the result. Um, the, the mandate was rejected, and we're now going towards the next vote. Um, so that has really resonated. But I think we're all now in a position where we actually don't, we're not facing a simple yes or no vote anymore. Um, what is on the table is, is really sort of a, a, a nuanced vision for the internet. What do we want? What can we, what can we have? And, and how, do we, how do we make use of the best of times? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not as optimistic, I think, as Martin, and, but it is a good time. And, and there's a great opportunity ahead to really modernize internet and really fix copyright. Basically, that's our URL of the landing page we're building, um, fixcopyright.wikimedia.org. Um, go there tomorrow. Um, thank you. Um, but yeah, so the opportunity is actually great. We're not only like talking about Article 13. We are right now, but we shouldn't be. There's um, so much in there. There's text and data mining exceptions. There um, is um, possibly freedom of panorama, so the use of um, images of buildings and 3D art, a different word for sculpture, statues in public spaces. Uh, there's maybe even a user-generated content, content exception. Um, there are safeguards for the public domain that really make sure that everybody can, can participate in cultural heritage. I think we should also talk about that. The, the opportunity is really great to bring copyright in Europe, which also affects Americans, obviously, into the digital age. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll also jump in. It's also nice to be with another company that has user-based moderation. Um, <laughs> we are often the only ones. Um, so I assume that there are a lot of Redditors in the room tonight, but for anyone who's not familiar with Reddit, Reddit is a community of communities. So you can go on Reddit and find you know, every niche little message board about anything that you are interested and passionate in. And those message boards are run by moderators who um, come from the community. We don't, we don't have any official formal relationship with them. We most of the time don't know who they are. They're just users who are really passionate about something. And they they create individual rules for their individual communities, and they are often very obscure rules. So we have, for example, a community called Cats Standing Up, and um, all of the photos that are in there must be of a cat standing up on two legs. And the rule is, um, for all of the comments, um, you may only comment with the word cat. Anything that is not the word cat will be removed by their moderator um, bot that they have built for this purpose. Which, like, it sounds silly, but it's a really good demonstration of the level of autonomy that we give our moderators. Because we think that community is really important and no one knows, you know, the, the culture like the community leaders themselves and the members of the community. So we are always thinking about how we can build healthy, independent communities on Reddit. So the problem with laws like this, in, particularly, in particular those that take away um, safe harbor provisions like this one does, is that they force 
us as kind of Reddit administrators at the corporate level to have to do more rather than being able to empower the community to do it for themselves. Because when it comes to liability, and we're talking about you know millions of dollars of fines that we have to pay, um, we can't take any chances. And so as a result, we end up having to take down more content because we are the ones that would be liable for it. And it doesn't feel good. And it is bad for our community relations. Our communities hate it, even when they understand um, the reason why we have to do it. So like a good example here in the United States is there was um, a law passed um, earlier this year called SESTA and FOSTA around sex trafficking stuff. Um, and because it takes away the safe harbor that was um, provided by a law in the United States called um, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, it suddenly made us criminally liable, potentially, for anything that might fall into that category. So as a, as a result, we, you know, our lawyers said we had to take down entire communities that were probably fine and probably weren't breaking the law at all, but, you know, the, the liability is too great. Um, and so it just, laws like this create a lot of tension between community-based usership and administrators, and it just underscores um, how bad they are for the spirit of the open internet and the idea that people can come together and create their own communities and um, have freedom in governing those communities any way that they see fit. Yeah, I think, I think this is a really important point to talk about um, how this affects the ability of services to both empower their users and also how developers and creators of, of, of these services can empower themselves and, and, and maybe provide alternatives. The thing that, that we'll probably touch on later is that there's been a shift in strategy by um, uh, the advocates of Article 13, and you'll see that the new compromise amendment that I, I think we're expecting to see pop out of the discussion in the next few days um, doesn't mention copyright filters. It, does, it doesn't talk about it. What it talks about instead is a sort of uh, a, a removing of that liability protection for, um, for online service providers, which are just defined as anybody who shares information that, that, that they're given via uploads. And, uh, and what it basically says is that they should be considered as vulnerable to being sued for copyright violation, uh, which means that basically you would have to set up a copyright filter, otherwise you would be eternally liable for copyrighted material that, that is infringing um, uh, appearing on your website. The problem here is, once again, like those mysterious chips, um, there's really no way of creating a filter that can, can scan for copyrighted material. I mean, first of all, as I said previously, that's everything. So you could create a filter that just didn't allow anybody to upload anything. What you're really looking for is infringing material, which is to say material that someone else who is not the uploader um, uh, 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 created. Um, that le leads to the craziness, as you've probably read, about people who've played Bark getting their content taken down because Sony thinks that it owns the copyright in Bark because it recorded some musicians playing Bark and they handed that over and triggered the algorithm because it went, are these both Bark? Sony must not want it up. Um, we have situations um, where people have live streamed um, uh, incidents and then those incidents have been played on national TV, and then the original live streamers of that incident have had their content taken down, because it's the big TV must obviously own the copyright on this, and you managed to go back in time and show this content and upload it before they even made it. Um, I've, I've talked to, um, some of you may know a TV show, uh, a, a show called Democracy Now! Um, I've spoken to um, uh, the, uh, uh, Goodman, the, the, uh, Amy Goodman, who, who presents that show, and she's described situations where her talks have been shut down because there's been a copyright request, um, uh, trigger based on material that she'd filmed in a war scenario in, in, in a, 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 an area that was later on used in a documentary which was copyrighted and triggered these filters. So, so we're in this crazy situation and what's being asked for is um, uh, most honestly impossible, but the next best thing to impossible is something that 
just means that we, we end up shutting out lots of content or allowing these false, false uh, positives to happen. Um, the other thing that's important to note here is that the pioneer in these copyright filters um, was, was, was Google, it was YouTube. YouTube introduced Content ID as a compromise in one of these earlier copyright battles. And we've documented ever since copyright um, uh, um, Content ID first emerged what a disproportionate effect that has on users. As you've noticed in the previous examples I've given, it's always like a big rights holder being able to exert this control over small rights holders. And that's because the big rights holders are the people who have a vested interest in feeding their materials in to the algorithm. But the other side of it is, is that um, people can use this as a, as a weapon. Um, I've been dealing with a case of the Ecuadorian government. The Ecuadorian government for many months employed a Spanish company to use copyright takedown requests to uh, remove any criticism of uh, the Ecuadorian president from opposition media on, on YouTube uh, by claiming copyright in pictures and video of the Ecuadorian president, um, which points to the other problem, right? Even that may be true, right? The Ecuadorian president, film of the Ecuadorian president may be copyrighted by the official Ecuadorian state presidency, but we have fair use, and fair use allows us to critique and appraise material. Uh, even if it's copyrighted material. Copyright is not a, a universal um, trump card to play about content. You can, there are exceptions and limitations to it. But there's no way that we can program those exceptions and limitations into an algorithm. I mean, coping with VAT is bad enough, right? If you've ever built a commerce site, right? This is talking about the spirit of the material and the way that was intended, right? This is why it affects memes, right? No one would ever claim that memes weren't um, a, a, a fair use of the original content material. If you look at all the, the factors that govern fair use in the United States, at least, they, they would get through. But if you looked at them as an algorithm would and just basically comparing these things and looking to see whether they're the same, um, they, would, they would trigger a false positive. It, it makes total sense. And that's why we have laws instead of algorithms. Laws have subtlety to them. They have ambiguities to them, much as it drives you know, geeks like me absolutely crazy. There are, but that ambiguity is there for a reason. And the reason is so we can, we, we can have these discussions about what's right and what's wrong, that we can have content moderation where people could go, you know what? I, I think that was a legitimate thing to put up. And we're having an ongoing discussion about that right now. If you make it illegal or make some, a, co a company or even an individual person liable to an ambiguous decision that they're then expected to create a program to implement, that just means that everyone will run screaming out of the room. No one will accept that level of liability. and everyone will be able to scare everybody else off by going, you know what, you're gonna be in a lot of trouble if you write that program, because everyone will try and sue you. My, one more point. My biggest concern <laughs> is not just about the people here today. My biggest concern is actually about the future of the internet. So I've been spending a lot of time on Mastodon. Mastodon is a great, interesting experiment in an alternative to Twitter. Um, and, uh, and potentially other sites, right? It's got an open protocol. It, it, it's, it's an interesting experiment. Um, it has thousands of users, thousands of users in Europe. That means that suddenly Mastodon uh, administrators, who basically do this in the spare time, will be vulnerable to this kind of law. That's an alternative to the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, and it's a European developed alternative, and this, the Article 13 would make that and its users liable. So that's the content moderation part of it that I'm concerned about. Well, that's great. My next question is actually about the future, but I also, because you mentioned the words fair use, um, I did want to mention one thing. Uh, we've been talking a lot about Article 13 of the Copyright Directive, um, and obviously, as you mentioned, filters don't necessarily know how to 
detect fair use, but fair use is, and you mentioned that it's an only US concept. So fair use doesn't exist in the EU, and that actually is significant also when you think about Article 3, which uh, deals with text and data mining. And right now, what the proposal says is that the exception to copyright for text and data mining is only limited, is only allowed for um, research organizations doing it for scientific purposes on a non-for-profit basis. So that is extremely limiting. Um, and when you think about the fact that fair use does exist here, um, developers who are mining content, you know, doing machine learning, et cetera, probably don't have to worry about it so much because we have fair use. In the EU, because that doesn't exist, it's really going to disproportionately affect EU companies, EU developers, um, who are trying to, who would otherwise be able to mine content, but now have to think about licensing. Um, so I think, you know, though we're focused on the EU and this EU law, there's a lot of attention to the US companies that would have to comply with the restrictions and the requirements, but really, you know, the EU companies are also at a disadvantage when you think about something like fair use that doesn't exist um, for, for the EU. Um, but okay, my future question, I'm gonna go with Jessica for this one. Imagine this proposal passes. 10 years from now, how will this have affected the internet as we know it, and how will history look back on this moment? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned that, that Redditors really care very deeply about kind of broad health of the global internet issues. You know, they're very active on this, they're very active on things like net neutrality. Um, but what I see this law playing into um, in, in, in terms of how it would impact the, the long term is a really dangerous trend that is part of why I personally got into the technology policy space in the first place. I previously worked in international diplomacy related to the Middle East, but when you look at the technology policy um, pathways that are happening right now, there is this incredibly dangerous trend towards balkanization of the internet and moving from the internet being a worldwide free space for expression across borders and cultures to one that is very much nationalized with firewalls and rules country by country. And that's not the internet that is familiar to us. That's not the internet that is useful. And that's not the internet that is going to move humanity forward. Um, so I, I see this, this playing into that division of the internet, and I think that it's really, really scary because it takes away um, connectivity internationally of, of people that is just so necessary for solving the large shared global problems that we all face as a global community. Okay. Do either of you want to add anything there? War, pestilence, no. Um, I, think, I, I think that some of you may know about the DMCA, and the DMCA is sort of interesting because it's an American copyright law um, that has sort of been exported to the rest of the world. Because tech companies are often based, internet companies are based in the US, they tend to comply with the DMCA's takedown provisions, um, uh, which are bad, and we've criticized them in the past, but they're not the worst that, that you could imagine. For instance, there is a provision that allows you to request that your content be put back up. Um, and so content providers are both obliged to take down content if they receive a DMCA request, otherwise they lose their liability predictions. But if you send a counter notice, you can get your content put back up. And um, that's how the the companies protect themselves against liability from you suing them for taking their content down. Um, the Article 13 is, is the DMCA cubed, let's say. Um, and what that will mean is that, frankly, you know, the Facebooks and the Googles will be fine. Um, uh, in fact, I think this probably cements their place at the top of this ladder because they will have a lot of money to create these filters. They may even be able to make some money selling the filters that they have already built to other people. Um, Apple is just in the middle of buying um, a, a major sort of uh, um, uh, music analysis um, company. So if that goes through, Apple will get to license that. And maybe if Apple doesn't like your business model, they won't license that to you, opening you up for liability. Um, so they'll be fine. You can expect 
those logos to be on your computer in 10 years' time if Article 13 passes. Few things will other things will happen. There will be a lot of projects that start and then die very quickly. There will be a lot of services that open up, get so big, big enough that they begin to be an attractive liability target to be sued, and then go down again. And if you've ever seen the progress of an open source project that gets to a certain size, it's doing okay, and then it faces sort of management or, or um, uh, uh, community issues and then dies again. That will be the natural arc of not just uh, uh, websites but web services that share things. I think you're also going to see some interesting um, effects in Europe. Uh, the EU has gone through a sort of rough stage at the moment um, with, with um, um, it's, it wasn't my fault, Brexit. Um, and, uh, but one of the things I've definitely noticed is that there's been a sort of restoring of faith in the EU. The EU has sort of striven to, to work harder and I think has a fairly good reputation in a lot of ways. And part of that reputation in the digital space, space I have to say, is probably part of the, because of the GDPR. And people like the GDPR. Lots of people do. And, um, and they like it because it seems like, you know, a way of regulating a thing that they're worried about. If you have Article 13 start, lots and lots of websites are going to either shut down because they'll say, we can't deal with this, or they're just going to ignore the law. Um, and either of those things is not good for the EU's reputation. Uh, so I feel like the next opportunity the EU or a company has to do, or a, 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 a country like that, to do positive regulation will be damaged by the effects of Article 13. The final thing is, is that what we saw with the DMCA, and we'll see here, is the weaponizing of it. So in many ways, things uh, it's, it's true that Europe doesn't have fair use, but that hasn't been as much of a problem as you might think it would be. The fact that Lots of everyday uses of copyright in, in the EU are de facto forbidden, um, such as making a copy of a CD and putting it on your, um, your phone and your music player, which means that you know iPods were technically a, a product that had no, anyway, ancient history. But um, the, the, the situation that we'll find is people will just ignore it. Um, except under circumstances where they plan to benefit from it. And what that means is, is that there will be very targeted uses of Article 13, very targeted lawsuits um, against certain services that cross the line in other areas. That may co might come from rights holders, but frankly, I think it will come mainly from trolls and political trolls in particular, right? Like, if you don't want... If you don't like what a service is showing, if you don't like the content that a service is showing, if you don't like Reddit, for instance, sorry to pick on you, but if you don't like Reddit because either they're a hotbed of feminism or that they have um, the, the Donald Trump Reddit, right? Easiest thing to do is not to debate that or, um, or, 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 or take them down because of that. The easiest thing is just to sue them over copyright violation, and that's because copyright is easy to sue over, and easier even now to sue over post-Article 13. So you're going to see a lot of those kind of takedowns, and finally you'll see a sort of divisiveness within Europe. So one of the things that the Article 13 doesn't touch on, and any of these things touched on, touches on, is that there are exceptions and limitations to copyright in Europe, like fair fair use-like provisions, but they're all different in every single country, which means that suddenly you can be liable in one country of the EU for a copyright violation, but not be and be defended and protected in another. This is exactly the opposite of what the EU is supposed to do, right? This bill, this, this article will create differences and collapse for, for the, until it's um, revoked the very digital single market that the EU is setting out to create. So, in summary, I think this will be this will be hard on the little sites, the new sites, the new European sites in particular that are created by developers, and I think it will be bad fundamentally for the EU and the rule of law in the EU.
So, um, I'd like to add to that. Um, I think we've heard about balkanization of the internet and sort of, I guess, cementing, entrenching the, the, the dominant position of, of incumbent players now. And I, and I, I think I'd, I'd sort of like to add to that that we will also see an internationalization of that problem of these, let's like say in broad terms, very limiting factors to, to um, basically participation and, and access to knowledge. Um, I think if, if, if we think ahead, this passes, which was your question, what will the future look like? I think we'll see a lot of regions and countries that um, have or already have weak protections for fundamental rights online go the same route. Um, I think of Southeast Asia, um, also African countries that have a lot of copyright reforms coming up over the next couple of years, uh, by the way. Um, and maybe also Latin American countries um, that will probably look at the EU and say, well, if they can do this, if they can um, grant this level of protection to rights holders, to large rights holders, um, and, and not open up their law to all these new uses um, that are sort of strange to us, um, I think lawmakers in, in various regions will actually say, let's do this as well. And, and then we will not only have um, the, the large players uh, out of the US still in place, but they will actually also be the only large players in internationally. We will not see um, new platforms emerging in, in Southeast Asia, which is very important for, for our communities, right? Uh, for, and for the people that we care about, uh, that these people can also access knowledge, that they can participate at an international level, that they, this is really the beauty of the internet, that people collaborate um, across not only borders, but also across across cultures and um, people who disagree because of their cultural backgrounds may collaborate. Uh, but if, if um, laws like this go around the world like, like a new wave of regulation, we will not see that across the globe. Um, and I think that's something that I'm really worried about. Great, well, thanks so much. I'm just keeping an eye on the time and I would like to invite Martin to jump up here and take my spot um, because I wanna make sure we have time for questions and for people to answer them. Um, I just think maybe, I mean, I don't know how many people have questions, but I think if anybody has a question for Martin, maybe we could do that first because you've probably been patiently waiting. Um, but I would like to encourage everybody with a question to just raise your hand, let me know, and I will bring you the microphone. Uh, so, like, um, from a meta perspective, the regulators try to, like, uh, in a sense, push bad code, and we always go like, "Hey, stop! It's not gonna work. You're you're ruining it. You're ruining innovation, etc." Um, so, like, my question would be, um, what kind of like meta solutions do you envision, or do you entertain any ideas uh, that might be a solution? Any wild ideas? Like, this keeps happening over and over again with different issues. This time, copyright, net neutrality, blah, blah, blah. And I'm from Turkey, so like, it's a whole another place with this. So like, what kind of solutions do you envision that we might achieve in like five years, 10 years? Like, what might it be? Like, hacker one for governance, maybe. I think you're asking the question, what is the role of democracy? And, and maybe I'm misreading your question, but there will always be honest mistakes by legislators and they will always fix it a little bit when we take action. And it will never be perfect. And when it's perfect, it's not like we will go under. We are strong enough to survive, but life will be more unfair. And when life is unfair, uh, angry young people will do bad things. So, so we must not let uh, legislation become unfair because it leads in the long term to weird side effects that we couldn't e expect but we must always be ready to stand up for democracy which means the decision-making power of the people and we will not we don't deserve it unless we take it maybe that was not your question but I think it is the answer I I want to jump on that as well and talk about, you know, how how we approach this at Reddit. You know, we try and be very collaborative with 
lawmakers because I think I always try and approach them um, from the standpoint of understanding that they have good intentions. I think that it's really important to always assume that everyone has good intentions and that there is really an education gap um, that I can help fill. So I see a lot of my role in working with lawmakers in the United States and other places um, to teach them about how the internet works, how individual platforms work, how platforms are different from each other, and to think more broadly about the unintended consequences of what they, they write. Because um, I find, number one, we'll get better laws that way. And number two, it's just better in general to have um, more collaboration between industry and, and lawmakers. Um, that said, every single lawmaker that I deal with would so much rather hear from you guys and constituents than you know someone like me who's like a paid corporate shill. Um, so anyone who's who's cynical about calling their member of Congress, calling their member of European Parliament, don't be because I found that they it really does matter um, and they really do appreciate hearing from informed constituencies who can teach them something. I think sometimes it's not even about informed constituencies. It's about showing up, about showing that these are real people. And and I think one of the large pushbacks that we've seen around the July 5th vote in, in the European Parliament was basically the argument, well, these campaigns, people calling MEPs, sending emails, these are bots. These are not real people. And um, I think that sort of uh, reinforces the the... The, the fear that some of these people um, in Parliament have of, of technology, right? If it's a bot calling you, you don't even pick up, but it's too late and when you realize, right? Uh, it's, 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 this, it's this embedded fear of technology, of maybe also Silicon Valley taking over, um, Silicon Valley benefiting of European culture, um, using their pipes, uh, using their infrastructure, um, and extracting money, making money with European culture. I think it's a lot about showing that there are European communities here. Um, Wikipedians exist all over Europe. Um, I would even argue that e Europeans are probably the strongest communities that we have. Um, and it's, for us, it's really a challenge to, to show that, or to explain to lawmakers that it's people using these technologies and benefiting from them and also who are affected by these laws. It's not just the companies. I realize I'm going to give a somewhat theoretical answer, so I'm going to get very practical before this, which is that if you do want to speak up, and you absolutely should, um, because what everybody said there is correct, like MP MEPs are surprised and delighted when people care about what they're doing, even if it's people telling them they're doing it wrong. Um, uh, go to saveyourinternet.eu and click on your country. Is that one that's behind me? No, this is, this is, the, this is another map of Europe. But if you uh, go to saveyourinternet.eu, uh, you can actually see the MEPs listed and you can start writing now as I talk to you. You can, not what I'm saying, just type your own opinions. Um, on the theoretical level to this, I think that there's a very specific problem that we face in these, with, with these kind of issues, which is the difference between concentrated power and um, distributed power in the, 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 um, the provisions that have got through this and have been successful are um, provisions that represent a very legible and known and uh, centralized power like the press publishers or the media industries. And the problem that we face collectively is that we're very all over the place, right? Like there's, it's, it's a bit like a political party that has millions of people, but only a hundred in every constituency, right? In every place, right? We're so distributed, we're not a majority in one particular place, or even really in one particular industry. While people think about what you worry about is being a product of Silicon Valley, and that's how they think about it. The truth is, is that people who use the internet and benefit from it and recognize this as a problem are uh, scattered all through the demographics. So if you want to think about a solution to this and start working on it, think about how we might build systems that can make very distributed groups of people who might otherwise have nothing in common able to speak with the same power as very centralized, concentrated voices. 
And um, if anybody else has a question, please raise your hand. In the meantime, I will just explain what this is here. Um, we it, So the Save Your Internet site uh, does also have a way for you to say who your MEP is. Um, but to the point about bots, we've been hearing that a lot of people have been using that site and then using the um, sort of generic suggested language there and then people who receive it think that they're bots. So we just found the you know standard find your MEP site. It is www.europarl.europa.eu slash MEPs um, slash, I think that's all you have to do actually. Um, yeah, the rest was just- Send postcards and flowers. Yeah. So yeah, um, and then you get this page and you can find your MEP by choosing your country, et cetera. So um, this works, the Save Your Internet site works too, but I think what's really important is to tell your story, make it personal, use your, you know, whatever details um, you think you wanna share that show that it's actually you and not just some bot. Um, yeah, is there, are there any more questions? Anything else you guys would like to add? Great. Well, oh, go ahead. Well, so the vote is this in a week. Cool. Yeah. I, this is all I'm going to say is like call now because the vote is in a week. We're in this transitional stage where the MEPs literally don't know what they're going to do because none of the parties have decided what to do. Um, we won the last vote because MEPs just went, you know what? No one's telling me what to do. But all these constituents say this is a bad idea. And that's what we need to do now. We're getting coherent message from the people who do want Article 13 to get through. They're getting Paul McCartney to call up. They're getting all of these letters. And you, the one power that we have is how many people are upset about this. Um, and that's the message you really have to convey. And to the software developer, developer community in particular, it's, it's really important, as I mentioned before, not many people are focusing on the unintended consequences for software. GitHub and a lot of individual developers and a lot of other organizations and companies have been, in the recent months, really trying to raise the concerns to policymakers, but a lot of them still don't really understand it or know how software development works. And as I mentioned before, we have 700 plus new MEPs that are now voting a week from today who, for, since, for all of the time that the negotiations have been going on, did not have to pay attention at all. So I think it's a lot for them to get up to speed on. And if you have a moment to just send a quick message to your MEPs and explain that you're very concerned about software development, we'd love you to do that. Um, GitHub has written a few blog posts. If you go to blog.github.com and click on the policy tab, we wrote one, the most recent one was August 24th, and it has links in that one to previous posts that also give you some sense of the broader issue, a lot of what we covered tonight, and hopefully um, more information that you need, but also feel free to reach out to policy at github.com. Um, we'd be happy to chat with you. Thanks so much. Did you, go ahead, Danny. One more thing. Okay, so they will say to you, oh, don't worry, we got an exception for that. So because we're visible, we've been able to, the, 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 the authors of these, of these amendments have gone, okay, we'll put a special exception. There's a special exception for online encyclopedias. There's a special exception for open source repositories, whatever they are, we'll just scribble them in and maybe they'll shut up, right? If they say to you, don't worry, there's an exception for that, those exceptions don't work, um, and there is the rest of the internet that you need to protect. So please don't take that as an answer and say, no, this is still a problem. You still need to fix this. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.